Well, good morning. It seems we have quite a tight schedule today, so I'm going to get started. It's great to see a content track at a content marketing, uh, content uh, management system conference, whatever next. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, in the next 60 seconds, over 500 hours of content will be published to YouTube. Over half a million tweets will be tweeted. Over 65,000 photos posted to Instagram and around three and a half million Facebook posts. Bloody hell, eh? What a lot of content. Getting bigger every year. My name is Mike Atherton, and I do content strategy at Facebook. We will circle back to my employer a little bit later, but what I want to talk to you today about is, a, is about a practical way for marketing and content and design uh, to all come together uh, to deliver the right content to the right people at the right time. And that comes under the banner of content strategy, which has been described as putting the focus on useful and usable content. And it's the response to this kind of content overload that we've seen, and a discipline that takes a very customer-focused approach to what gets published online. But I gotta tell you, I, I speak at a lot of content marketing events and, and the content strategy community can get a bit sniffy about that. They hear the words content marketing and they think of things like you know, Outbrain or, or any other player in the kind of the bottom half of the, of the internet. But that's not really fair, is it? Useful and usable content shouldn't be incompatible with marketing, certainly not content marketing. Marketing these days is pretty much about relationship building. And when Seth Godin said that content marketing is the only marketing left, he was talking about reaching and engaging people with quality content. That happens all the time, like Airbnb with their city guides, which show off their passion for travel. Or MailChimp with their guides to better email marketing, or Intercom with their books on effective customer service. In all these cases, these brands establish trust and authority by showing us that they care about the things that we care about. They build a kind of relationship through genuinely useful and usable content. So you know, content strategy, content marketing, what's the difference? Gone are the days where we would just say content is king and use that as an excuse to empty out a filing cabinet full of PDFs onto the internet, or a whole bunch of custom microsites to build to, and hope that people would stop by. There's just too much content now, and the balance of power has arguably shifted from first-party siloed websites to distributed third-party platforms. In other words, people are less likely to get your content from your own website than they are to get it from YouTube or Facebook. So creating useful content is really only half the job. The other half is making it easy to find and easy to make sense of and actually easy to redistribute anywhere. And for that, we need structure. Because structure creates meaning. Understanding how things relate to one another is how we make sense of the world. It's how we learn. Now, in linear media like television or print, we can sort of force a structure of that learning. We can force a narrative structure, because people only experience a story in one direction. But of course, with digital information, that journey starts anywhere and everywhere. People follow links from Facebook, they type their searches into Google, and they arrive right into the middle of your, your content. And wherever they land, usually a specific page of content rather than a sort of index homepage or anything, you got just a couple of seconds to reassure them that they're in the right place. This is the droid they're looking for. And that they understand that how the thing that they're looking at connects to that bigger structural picture. But often it's not really there. That, often that structure, that wider context, is actually only implied by the way that the pages of a site or an app are arranged, something like this, the good old-fashioned hierarchical sitemap. Links and classification, they come from the navigation that's been added to the UI, but there's no explicit connections inherent within the actual elements of content, if you see what I mean. No connection, for example, between the new and used variants of a three-door mini, even though they're cognitively the same thing. All of the structure is on the page, but it isn't in the content. By contrast, when those structural connections 
are inherent to the content, well, then any and every interface will do. When we see these sidebars in our Google results, of course, they're constructed automatically by a computer, and that's possible because all of these little bits of content, actually from a bunch of different places around the web, have all explicitly asserted through their metadata that they refer to a specific TV show, in this case, Portlandia. So I wrote a book about all this stuff recently with my friend Carrie Hain. It's called Designing Connected Content, and it's based on work that we've done, well, for the BBC, for ASC, for British Parliament, uh, and others. It's a practical guide to what we see uh, as better content management. But what's connected content? Well, I like to think of it as content with built-in context. On a human level, it's connected to, to the things that matter to people. It's broken down according to how people think. And on a technical level, it has a sort of richly uh, interwoven, very granular structure. It scales up without breaking because that rigid hierarchy we, that we usually impose through sitemaps and the like, um, rather than doing that, we, we recognize that reality is sort of far more tangled and wibbly wobbly and it sort of resists constraint. And most importantly of all, the, both the content and the structure are stored outside of any specific interface. They're not pages, but they're chunks of content that can be used to compose page templates, which shouldn't be news at a Drupal conference. But these se this separation of resources, content chunks, and the representations, the, the, the interfaces in which they appear, makes your content ready, well, for any interface, even those that are yet to be invented. So I'd like to share this process with you now, but it begins with an inconvenient truth about your content, which is that nobody really cares about your content. Sorry, but it's true. I mean, no, no matter how glossy the production values, the content is really just a means to an end. So what is it that people do care about? Well. They care about stuff. They care about celebrities and cars and theme parks and movies and bands and recipes and pension plans and landmarks. Whenever somebody is engaging with your content, it's because they have an itch to scratch. They're, they're buying a house or they're planning a pension or they're considering a new car. And that's where content becomes useful. Content provides information about the world around us. It describes and defines and discusses and even debates things and ideas concepts and people and places. It, it furnishes us with facts. So it's not your content that's important. What really matters are the things that your content is about. Now that's a subtle distinction, but it's a very important one. To make compelling content, we need to figure out the specific types of things within a subject area and then make content about each of those things. So let's go find some things. Well, to do that, we need to focus on a subject. What subject shall we have? Maybe music, like Spotify, like outdoor pursuits, like REI, small business management, like FreshBooks. Well, if it were music, well, what does a music audience talk about when they talk about music? Well, it's things like the bands and the artists and the songs and the recordings and the albums and the record labels and the tours. So to make content to, to support a subject, make content specifically about the things in that subject. What is it that your customers truly care about? That's your subject domain. Now in the book we use a fairly simple subject domain, the world of conferences, much like this one. Uh, Carrie and I led the uh, content strategy for the IA Summit, now the IA Conference, uh, which is a 20-year-old annual community conference about information architecture. Rock and roll, huh? Um, now, it attracts some very high-value session content, uh, which actually stays relevant for years and years and years, because uh, it's kind of a bit sooty and a bit, like, infrastructural. Um, but as an event, it's kind of scrappy. It's kind of a low-budget event that's run by volunteers. And get this, year after year, when it came to their website, a volunteer would, would come in, a volunteer crew would come in, build a one-off website for that year's event, uh, and then when it was over, they would throw it all away, and the next bunch of volunteers would come in and build the next year's uh, uh, website, which is madness, but perhaps not entirely unfamiliar to anyone who's been through a corporate redesign. 
We wanted to change all that. We wanted a once and for all digital presence for the entire brand, distinct from particular uh, annual events and able to accommodate every annual event uh, into the future as part of a larger structure. So we spoke to some people um, close to the event uh, and figured out you know, what the most important things were. What, what was it that people wanted to, to know about? And they told us. They want to know who's speaking and what they're speaking about. They want to know when and where the conference is and how far away is it from the city. And it turns out that while they're at the conference, they want to use the website on their phones as a portable timetable of, with details uh, of when and where each session is held. And on some conferences, that can be quite a challenge. Um, and as any, any conference planner will tell you, all that information about sessions and speakers and times and dates can and will change up to and beyond the last minute. Now, all of this might sound very obvious, but as we know, without a plan, it's far too easy for brands and organizations to start to lose their way and start crowding out all the good stuff with all kinds of irrelevant vanity junk about their brand story and their sort of values and things that are of no interest to anybody but themselves. So instead, we, to try and stay focused, we did a lot of interviews, of which this is a fictional transcript. And we listened out for the things that people were talking about when they were telling us about the event. What were the most important things? And whenever they threw out a noun or a verb, we leapt on it and we questioned, like, what is it that you meant? How is a conference event different to the conference? What, is a lightning talk a type of talk? What are the other types of talks? Speakers and keynotes. Okay, are there two different classes of participant uh, sessions and social events? Is a social event, is that a session or is it not? Is it a different kind of thing? Uh, volunteers, how do they fit into the whole big picture? Sponsors, what can they sponsor? Are they sponsoring the entire event? Are they sponsoring sessions? How does it all work? And so we listed these things out. People wanted stuff about, as I say, about each person, each session, each event. And then some other things like the thematic track and the format of each session, which would help the other things make more sense. These would be the building blocks of our content strategy. And it keeps the focus on that useful and usable content. So we've located the, la the, the points of interest. But now we need a map to figure out how to travel from one to the other. Organizing information actually creates new information of its own. How something is classified or named affects how we interpret it. Um, content marketing, as far as I'm concerned, is supposed to be educational more so than promotional. And therefore, the learning comes from the links between uh, items of content. If we make the connections between the stuff in our domain, our domain entities, make those match up how they match up and interrelate in reality, the structure itself then does the hard work of helping a visitor make sense of how the, everything fits together. Learning in the links, what do I mean by that? Well, if you think back to the Oscars uh, and the connection between Bohemian Rhapsody and the Best Picture Oscar, well, it was a nominee. Whereas Green Book by the other, you know, same kind of uh, entities, different kind of relationship. This time it was a winner. Uh, Walt Disney to Snow White, often thought of as the director, actually the producer. So there's an important information that is contained within the link between two different concepts. This comes together in a technique uh, called domain modeling, uh, which is stolen from software engineering um, and has no place in a content marketing track, but uh, hopefully it does. A domain model is a logical concept model um, of how a subject hangs together. Now these connections, they might look a little bit wibbly wobbly, but that's all right, because each connection has that named description of its own. Showing us, for example, that each event is part of the master brand, that a person can be assigned a role, say a speaker or a keynote or a volunteer, uh, and there's a connection making it clear that, what a, that a sponsor could be associated with an entire event or just an individual session of which it has a subtype social session, such as the karaoke or the happy hour and that kind of thing. It takes a bit of getting used to, for sure, but actually it's a fairly simple model. And yet, it's powerful and reusable enough to hold true for that conference, and arguably any conference, now and into the future. 
So whatever your subject area, you can express its sub subject as a domain model. Well, things like restaurants, uh, or indeed live music, uh, or indeed my favorite, uh, theme parks. Um, getting it right is very much a team effort, but once you've got it, it's a super useful shared picture, something that your designers, developers, content creation people can all refer to. It's a common language and a common understanding of how your world joins up. But how do we go from this abstract model on paper to truly connected digital content? That's where we face up to the content management system and the inconvenient truth number two. Everybody hates their content management system. What a thing to say at DrupalCon, my goodness. All happy CMSs are alike, but all unhappy ones are unhappy in different ways. Like when you're given this so-called WYSIWYG editor with a box to enter the name of your page and another box for everything else. Um, this is how the IA Summit used to uh, manage session pages from their conference. All the relevant information is there, but it's only really there to the human eye. You can see the names and the faces of the session hosts, Carl and Christina here. But there's nothing going on behind the scenes to tell you or to tell the CMS that these are specific people holding the role of speaker at this specific event. Their names are linked, presumably, to their profile pages, but again, it's all done by hand. Uh, we see when and where the session um, takes place. But again, it's like it's static text that's all done by hand. Uh, and if anything had to change about this session, different people, different title, different room, or anything, all of those changes would have to be made everywhere that this information uh, has been created and stored. So the content's good, but it lacks structure. It's not connected. Now, fortunately, we, you've guessed it, we have a model that maps out exactly how those things should connect. All we need to do is teach that model to the computer, and thankfully, things like Drupal and other headless CMS uh, products like Contentful and a whole bunch um, have become a bit more evolved. So rather than thinking in a series of complete pages, they help you manage individual content chunks. And a chunk can represent something um, in our model, a chunk for a person or a chunk for a session or so on. Actually, those chunks are a little bit too chunky, so we can, we can break them down even more. Or can we? Yes, we can. Like a person who has a name and a face, and in our world, they have a job title and a bio and some contact information, and we can link the person to the role that they hold at the event, and if that role is a speaking role, we can li link them to each uh, session that they present. And these smaller granular trunks are a lot more useful. We can use them as ingredients for any kind of view that we can imagine. So what have we got? We've got a model for our content that's based on a deep understanding of our subject domain. We can configure our CMS to allow the entry of each content chunk, and with that configuration, also handling how the chunks relate to one another. Now, our CMS can look something like this, which is actually an early build of Drupal 8. Uh, unlike the old way, all that body information is now breaking, broken down into separate chunks, some of them even readable uh, by the computer, like, for example, the session start and end times. Um, and if we uh, associate uh, this uh, um, uh, session with a presenter, we're just making a, a connection between this sort of session object over here and that person object over there. Um, and if we need to sort of change the presenter for any reason or change their name, which happens all the time, uh, we can do so without breaking with the relationship uh, to the session. If they present more sessions at this event or in the future ones, we can just pick them again from the roster and add them to the new talk which has a built the, the added advantage of building up a useful picture of their speaking career. And it doesn't matter if we have one session or a thousand sessions or one event or 50 events. The structural integrity holds because it's based on those real world relationships. So with the CMS all set up, adding content now becomes pretty easy. We, we know exactly what piece of content, each piece of content should be about, right down to the last chunk. And through the model, we've agreed what's most useful to our audience. If, if it's an object in the model, we should have some content su to support it. If it isn't, we shouldn't. Pretty simple. 
the content has become truly connected within the CMS and not just on the page. All of these chunks of content can be remixed and reused endlessly. Like this schedule page, for example, where we just need to use a few of those chunks, a few of those fields uh, for each listing. And in fact, as we pointed out before, because the computer knows when and what uh, 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 each session starts and ends, it can compile this schedule list automatically. And if session times change, the list will be uh, uh, reordered automatically as well. Or this speaker page, where people who are assigned the role of keynote get a slightly bigger, slightly more important headshot at the top of the list. Um, uh, because of that little metadata flag that's been told, told the computer that they're, they're a keynote and not just a regular speaker. This page isn't laid out by hand, therefore. It's sort of powered by the magic that comes in the model. With your world of structured content already in place, content becomes, therefore, a design material. Uh, your richly linked structure, it represents a real world area of interest. Now we can, and so now we can think of each interface, be it mobile, desktop, Google sidebar, or whatever, as a window that looks through onto that same world of structured content beneath. And I think that's much better, why it's much better to do interface design sort of after all that structural work. Starting content strategy from a UI wireframe well, it's a bit like writing a novel by starting at the book binding or, or taking a scatter cushion first approach to, to architecture. Wireframes crush together so many different concerns of content and navigation and decoration before, often before we've even really had chances to think of, of any of them separately. Wireframes also often deal with like ideal world content with that big hero image that looks fantastic when it's a big celebrity close up, but pretty bad on slow days when you've got a business stock photo instead. But having to invested in our structural design up front, all these architectural decisions are effectively already made and already agreed with the team. Um, so each interface now becomes a series of templates, recipes that are made up from the ingredients uh, of our content chunks. And these carry, of course, connections to the related chunks, which weaves that content more and more tightly together. And if the content actually is already in place in your CMS by the time you're getting to this, this sort of interface design, any good UI designer can use live actual content to power their, their prototype templates. Here's the BBC food site uh, I worked on many years ago now, but now developed using this sort of tech uh, connected content idea. Uh, the model had things like recipe, chef, diet, ingredient, TV show, all of which you can rec start to see these represented in the, in the main navigation. But actually all of these are just exploring the same database of, uh, of recipe content through a different lens. Uh, each chef object has a name and a photo and a bio and it's associated with one or more recipes. Uh, on the mobile UI, by contrast, they had to make a different design choice, uh, only showing the name of each uh, chef. Following Nigella here, returns all of her recipes, a recipe a list, of course, that's kept up to date automatically. Uh, but these are the resources that get the most traffic. This is where people are jumping through from Google to specific recipe pages. When somebody lands here, of course, they've, they've got to see not only the content that they've come for, but also the surrounding context that gives it meaning. Once again, the content and its structural relationships are stored outside of this UI, this page. So HTML web pages are just one possible output. If you want, really want to get technical about it, you could send your structured content output to the, say, a JSON file, and it's cheap and easy to send that same content uh, to a smartphone or a smartwatch app, to digital signage, to uh, voice UIs like the Echo, or even to third party platforms like Google or indeed Facebook. Uh, uh, for each interface, you can actually make different design choices um, about which content chunks to include and how to display them. Uh, something that we do uh, in uh, Facebook Instant Articles, a little word from my sponsor. Uh, the Facebook developer site has got all the information that you need to set up uh, uh, the CMS, set up Drupal in this case, for publishing content uh, directly to the Facebook platform uh, as an instant article. Uh, it's really just a case of pasting a bit of code into a template header and you're all ready to, to reach two billion users. 
Now, structured content is, of course, not new. Um, but sometimes the design of that structure can happen without due consideration. Uh, as, and as we've seen, the structure actually drives the rest of the design. Uh, ja Jared Spool, the UX guy, talked, calls design the rendering of intent. Now, our intent is to build an audience through useful and usable content. But the stuff that makes it useful and usable isn't only in the content. It's also in the structure. Some of the learning is, is in how the content is, in, is broken down and connected so that it follows that human mental model and it maps to the things that people are searching for and the way people think. So, to sum up, content, uh, connected content helps brand alignment. No more random acts of marketing. You can make the most of what you've already got by freeing it from uh, an interface uh, and weaving it into a useful non-linear narrative. You can improve efficiency by making uh, content only for the things that are in the model, because those are the things that your, con that your audience are telling you they're interested in. You can make your next redesign a little bit less painful, because when your content's all connected under the hood, a UI refresh is really just that. And you can be nice to your customers by giving the right information on every touch point, even those platforms that you don't control, whether it's Facebook or Google or Twitter or phones or watches or internet fridges, uh, which used to be a thing. Um, you can put your co content where the audience is. Uh, and you can, if you can manage it centrally and share it broadly, you know, you'll be more places at once while still keeping control of your brand. So remember, find the things that matter to your audience, map that world and reflect it back to them, use it to connect all of your content chunks, and then spread it far and wide to create all the interfaces that you like. It's all powered by the same content and importantly, the same connective tissue. Let's face it, we're all selling something, but people care about what they care about. And you have a better shot at reaching them if you can show that you care about that too. Connect your content and then use it to connect with your customers. Thank you very much. For more of this, my book, Designing Connected Content, is available everywhere. And for your time today, thank you.